Today's pork pickup day at the butcher. Problem is though that all of our freezers are full, or at least partially full. Let me show you. Stew hens, little bit of bacon, the remains of Missy the sow. Broiler chickens and boxes of beef. Broiler chickens. Broiler chickens, turkeys for Christmas, hearts and livers. Beef and stew hens. Broiler chickens, hearts and livers. Beef. And pork. So what we got to do is shuffle things around, recombine them so that we free up a couple freezers because that's how much pork's coming back. Yeah. So first we'll dig all the stew hens out that are scattered all over the place and combine them into one freezer. This little guy ought to hold them all. So stew hens are all combined into a freezer full. We did about a hundred this year, hundred of them. They do sell at market, people have asked, and yes they do sell, they're good. Now we'll consolidate the chicken, the broilers. Look at the size of this chicken. Seven and a third pounds. That one's six pounds. We got some big chickens in here. This is the big freezer crunch for us. Filling them up for the winter, and then after this, we'll be drawing them down till the next batch of pigs goes at the end of the year. Yum, pork belly. This one I've been smoking off that old sow Missy. It's the best. So we emptied out these two freezers and part of another. You think that'll be enough space? It's gonna have to be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. We're gonna go pick up pork now. Will you shovel out that box? Shovel. It's good to have a wife that's good with a shovel. Can you shovel any faster? Can you shovel faster? No. The butcher is about a 15 or 20 minute drive away for us and on the way there I thought I'd show you some of the country and some of the type of farming that there is around our place. Here's this nice little place that's all buttoned up for the winter. wonder who lives there. This is the majority of what we've got around us in terms of land. Soybean fields, corn fields, triticale or winter wheat, hay fields. A lot of row crop farming. We have a lot of wood lots too and nice little gorges with streams running through them. Corn stubble. Most of the farms around here are either dairy or crop farms and when it comes to dairies most of the corn that they grow they chop. They chop for corn silage. They take a little bit of it as kernel corn off of a combine. But most of it gets chopped. Same with grass crops. Uh, a lot of alfalfa is grown. That gets green chopped and put into haylage. Either put in a bunk or a silo or baled into baleage. Here's a big field filled with strips of alternating corn which they plant through the corn with triticale or winter wheat in the winter to hold the soil and then the alternating rows are alfalfa. And then through here on the way to the butcher, we're at the very top of the watershed where it splits and the water doesn't quite know which way to go and so there's quite a bit of swamp. When it comes to dairy farming, when I was a kid, there were a lot of family dairies that were milking, I don't know, 30 cows even or more. And now there's kind of a split where family makes a living off milking 100 head, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. Multi-family dairies can do it with 200 head, and then there's a split above 200 head milk and where you get into the big CAFOs that are milking thousands of head. And we've got three or four big CAFOs in here, our town, and the neighboring town. And crop farmers to support that. And that's kind of the, the economics of agriculture where we are, historically big dairy country. And this road that we're on, we always called the wee road when I was a kid, because if you get going about 70 miles an hour on it, up and down these little bumps, you get a little wee every time you come up and down. Up and down, and up and down. Now, oh, there's more alfalfa. When I was a kid, normal field size was, you know, 10 acres, five acres. 
since then, a lot of those smaller fields have been cleared out and made into bigger fields, clearing out the hedgerows. I don't know if that's a good thing. There's a lot of cool things that happen in hedgerows as far as diversity of life and bird species and natural erosion control that's gone now, cleared out to 40, about 40 acre fields mostly. Sometimes they run as big as 100 acres. Topography here really limits field size because it's rolling hills and gorges primarily. And out in the country where we live, the countryside is dotted with small towns and we're coming into one now. This is Locke. And for those of you who've read my book, this is where the feed mill used to be that I talked about quite a bit in the book and it's a shame. It's gone. This little sad building is all that's left of it along with the remains of the old train station across the road. It's just a little four-corner town. This kind of beautiful country, rolling hills. And this is where our butcher is located, in the little town of Moravia. Actually, Moravia is a little bigger than a lot of the little towns around here. And the way that our geography works is we're in the Finger Lakes region. And at the ends of the Finger Lakes, this happens to be the end of Owasco Lake up here. The towns were more prosperous because back in the 1800s, the canals connected all the lakes, so the towns were a center of commerce. Ithaca is another town that's on the end of one of the Finger Lakes, and that's why these towns grew bigger originally. Although they've kind of lost some of their purpose now that the canal trade is over and the railroads are gone and the local feed mills are pretty much gone. Most people that live around here go to one of the bigger towns like Ithaca or Auburn or Watkins Glen to work or they work on a farm, but there's not as many jobs on the farms as there used to be, that's for sure. And here we are at the butcher, Wasco Meats. Look at that guy's honeydew list. When am I getting my honeydew list? <laughs> Any day now. Here goes the honeydew man. Here's how these pigs came back. There were seven pigs and this is dress weight after slaughter. 151, 170, 135, 152, 150, 166, and 137. It's lighter than I would like. Usually we shoot for 200 pounds as being the ideal dress weight. But remember I was experimenting more with hand feeding and limiting their feed because the batch before this that went last winter's batch was too fatty. It had too much back fat which we have very little use for. We barter it with a soap maker. We use it to cut venison sometimes when I hunt deer. Uh, the, the, the side bacon or the pork belly was a lot fattier than I would like for bacon so we went to hand feeding this summer. I should have hand fed some more probably and I've upped the feed for the last eight that are in the lot still and hopefully we can get those up to 200 pounds. Let's take a look at the cuts. Oh, let's see, what do we got? This is a pork butt roast, which has cut off the butt end of the front leg. That's why it's called butt roast. It's not from the butt of the pig. <laughs> it's got a decent amount of fat on it. You know, I like to see them more with a quarter to a half inch fat cap on them. These things are delicious. Pork chops are a good bellwether, just like I did with rib steaks or ribeye steaks at the last batch. That's a rib chop, the equivalent of a ribeye steak in beef, and it's still got a good amount of marbling, still got a nice amount of fat around the outside, so I'm pretty happy. You know, if you grow a pig to 200 pounds and they trim off 20 pounds of fat after it hangs, you might be better off feeding to 180 pounds and not having all that fat. So, we try to hit a balance.
six pounds. What are you ladies up to? What, my hand's not sweet enough for you? These ladies are my best friends now. You guys are always waiting for your treats, aren't you? Yeah, you are. Let's see, six, twelve, eighteen. They haven't figured out that I put in a second tray for them so they only have to eat two to a tray. So I guess I'll have this as an afternoon snack. I've been looking around the internet and doing some math on corn finishing these ladies and what I've found is for an average size steer about 20 pounds of corn a day for the last three or four months. So I'm feeding these gals a total of 40 pounds a day. There's four of them, so that would be 10 pounds a day each. And they're about half the size of, say, a full-grown Angus steer, so that should be about right. I spent a week, week and a half, ramping them up, and today they're hitting their full ration. About 18, 20 pounds feeding, 15, 20 pounds feeding. You know, it's not exact, and I'm mixing in a little bit of sweet feed. I'll probably take that out and just feed them cracked corn because sweet feed's slightly more expensive. They sure do love it. I am looking forward to seeing how this experiment goes. What are you doing? And while I'm up here in the upper barn, I might as well show you our hay supply. We're doing really good with hay this year. We've been feeding for about a month. We've got about three and a half, no, four and a half months to go. I'm going to have plenty of hay this year. I only wish the good stuff that I cut is way in the back. And the, the stuff I bought is not as good as the stuff that I made this year. I'd love to be able to pull second cutting bales out of the back and feed them in here to the heifers because I think that would help them a lot. I thought about pouring some molasses on this hay, but I figured, well, they're getting enough carbohydrates out of that sweet feeding corn that I'll probably just let it be. But as soon as I can get to that second cutting, I'm going to start feeding them second cutting. You guys are all hanging out at the mineral feeder, eh? Getting yourself some vitamins. sunbathing. It's thawing out today. It's got to be close to 45 degrees. We haven't had a thaw in probably a week. Feels nice. Nice and sunny. Ezra, what's going on? Where have you been? Your face is all dirty. Where have you been? Your face is all dirty. You've been out tomcatting, haven't you? You got pieces of burdock in you. You got burdock in your tail. My gosh. You've been gone all day. Look at your face. You're all dirty. See this little guy, he's got no tag, but I know this is Squirrel. And we named him Squirrel because he's so freaking squirrely. It's true, he's squirrely. All right, I googled bad joke, and this is what I got. I was trying to organize a professional hide-and-seek tournament, but it was a complete failure. Turns out good players are hard to find. Cow 
almost love my jokes. What do we got going on in here? Howdy, roaches. Hi, Mom. Brownie, still very pregnant. You guys need some more bed. Why do I use wood chips for bedding? Well, these are kiln-dried wood chips, which means they're really absorbent, good and dry, and they cost me about the same as a bale of straw. Straw is quite expensive around here, and I have the added bonus that it's much easier to remove from the pen with a shovel, put it into a wheelbarrow. Straw mats down, ties itself together. It's kind of a pain to get out. This is very easy. <laughs> you goo. Oh, they just love new bedding. Mom. Oh! Even mom does. Everybody starts jumping around. There they go, the little roaches. Back and forth. is still very pregnant. Her udders really aren't filling up that much yet, maybe just a touch. And that's what we use to know when she's that close to going. But we keep an eye on her. Brownie, you gain so much weight when you're pregnant. Your belly gets so big. This will be Brownie's second litter, and for those of you who are around in the spring, she had 12 piglets for her first litter. A lot of them didn't survive because they were small, but 12 on a first litter? Oh. That's pretty good. Everybody gets happy with new bedding, don't they? Yeah. Happy day. Warm out, fresh bedding. Life's good. Doc is spaced out chewing his cut. Howdy, Doc. Here's my random thought of the day. When Hillary and I were out, I turned on the radio and there was this lady singing a song and she seemed to sing the same phrase over and over again, although I'm not really sure it was a lady because it was so heavily filtered through auto-tune that you couldn't really tell. Looks like the lady's water is okay. I guess one of the reasons I don't get out very much is because every time I go out, I see things becoming less and less handmade. More and more of the restaurants are chains get the same food wherever you go in the country. Houses all look the same wherever you go in the country. The malls all, the stores all, they all look the same. I like handmade. I like handmade music. Music from those grubby early 70s groups that was good musicianship and they made mistakes and you could tell it was analog, it wasn't digital, it wasn't corporate. Everything seems to be becoming part of a bigger and bigger thing instead of each person making What's unique to them? Ladies, I guess I should have been born a hundred years earlier than I was. I don't know. Don't play with that. It's not a toy. Don't play with that. Well, I guess that's too much speculating and thinking about for one day. Hey, I hope you have a great day. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I'll see you next time.